You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers about hikers for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming along to listen to our last episode before Christmas. This is episode number 405 of Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. And today, well, I've got a kind of unusual story to share with you. Clark L. Ward hiked the trail this year. He finished, but it was the story that he was trying to share with his fellow hikers that is what today's show is about. Clark is a Native American, and to be honest, he told me a few things that I'd simply never heard of. And as you'll hear, his story, while about hiking, is about so much more as well. We'll hear from Clark in a moment. After Clark, we'll catch up with Jessica, with what looks like being her second-to-last catch-up on the show, as she and I and Mike are now just 40 miles from their own Katahdin, just south of the bridge, into Harpers Ferry, where they plan to finish this coming Saturday. Some of this hike hasn't been pretty, but it's always been gripping, and she is at last starting to believe it'll almost be over, and she'll be the fourth of our Mighty Blue Class of 2023 to complete a calendar year through hike. Or maybe the fifth, if we consider that Steve Noda finished his hike after it had been interrupted last year. In next week's show, I should have a recording of Jessica from Harpers Ferry at the end of her more than nine-month hike. And talking about getting to the end, George Stefanos today relates his climb up Katahdin almost 40 years ago. One last thing before we start, I'll also be announcing a bit of a change of plan for this podcast, so hang about and listen to that after our main guest. Now, (laughs) this recording had to be edited so much this week. Clark had a bad hum in the background, and I removed a lot of it, so it isn't too bad at all. Worst of all, though, was the fact that the connection kept dropping out, and I had to remember what we'd been talking about when it clicked back in. If I say so myself, it was a pretty intense but pretty successful edit, so I hope you enjoy our conversation. Here's Clark. My guest today recently completed his Appalachian Trail through hike. He is Clark L. Ward, or Wild Coyote. Hey, Clark, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hello, nice to see you. Yeah, <laughs> well, we can't see each other. We we're having a <laughs> few technical glitches, but yes, uh, nice to see you too. Uh, now, your story has proven very difficult for me to structure, really. But I want to start with your heritage. You're a Native American, and you've had a hell of a life. Tell us the motivation that got you out on a long-distance trail and the cause that you carried with you. My motivation was to spread the word that every child matters and to get more people to understand and realize the need for this. And it wasn't happening around here, and I felt I needed to go hike along the whole Appalachian Trail to do this, and this would give me motivation to do the hike and successfully complete it. And this Every Child Matters, are you talking specifically about Native American children? I mean, Every Child Matters means Every Child Matters, obviously. But is this a specific thing that came about because of uh, the history of Native American children? It is. It absolutely is. And it also comes back to me being adopted into a family and being brought up in a way that never allowed me to know my complete heritage at all. Right. And I also adopted a couple children that definitely I feel for and need to bring up the right way. And they need to see the reality of being loved and being wanted. And from in your experience then, because I, I, I took a lot of notes, obviously, when we spoke, before and they're a bit jumbled which is another reason I found it quite difficult to tell the story um this is you are talking about something to do with whole scale children taken away and put in reform schools until about 1972 which is not that long ago so tell me what happened these children were separated from their Native American family and their heritage they were forced to speak the American language never able to speak their language again, had to 
be brought up in the Catholic ways and do and say everything they said. And they, and if they didn't, they would get punished and horribly treated. And uh, they took away so much. And but, they, but on sorry, on whose authority do they do this? On what you know, just taking children away from their folks. I mean, what happened? This had to be. I'm not sure exactly who set the commands out, but it was part of the government. I'm, I definitely know that they wanted to erase the history of the Native Americans, which they've still been trying to do. So I don't really understand this because I don't know about enough about it, obviously. So it's difficult for me to, to know one way or the other. How did you, you have a story in your mind that something happened to these children um, how did it come to your attention or was this part of your, is this what happened to you yourself? I was brought up in a, a family where I could not have long hair. I was brought up in a Catholic church. I was never allowed to ever watch anything Native American or go to any festivals or know what a powwow was about. And once I realized who my family was, once I was 30, I found my family. Yeah, It, it just destroyed me. It just Every everyone should know their heritage and where they're from. So the main thrust of your message when you're on the AT was that this had happened to you personally, but it had happened to a whole generation of children. Is that pretty much the the basic basic story? Oh, absolutely. Yes. So how were you able to share that message on the AT? And did your and how did your fellow hikers respond to it? At first, I was a little nervous, and I wasn't sure how I was going to do this, but I knew if I brought the flag and wore the shirt, everybody would start asking questions. And that's how it started. And I get to the shelters and I just say, who would like to take a group picture and hold this flag and, and learn about what it's about. And everybody was always so willing to do this. (laughs) It was amazing. But did they understand what you were saying to them? Absolutely. Some people I don't think did. You get you could see that look in their face. But I offered everybody to ask questions and we talk and they listen to other people ask questions and talk. And everybody, I think, was really interested. Well, your lived experience isn't most of our lived experience, obviously. You know, I I, I, I was brought up comfortably with the same parents and in, in you know, where I was born. But in your case, your situation obviously was different. So the The flag that you carried, that's the one you had on Katahdin, wasn't it, as well? It is. And how did you carry that? Did you carry it around your shoulders? I mean, did you keep it constantly on show? I I wanted to keep it on my backpack and fly it off the pack. Right. But you know what? The the trees and the weather and everything was just (laughs) so miserable. So that wasn't happening. And I did it when I could. But when I get into the shelters and places, I'd always lay it down and have it around wherever I'm at. Right. Okay. That's good. So, um, and hiking for you has been a part of your life, I understand. You told me that you've done a lot of walking up and down the East Coast. Did that, is that, is that the same as hiking? Were you backpacking? I mean, what did that entail? You know, were you, were you just drifting up and down the East Coast or were you actually backpacking on a trail? I like that word you said, drifting, because I really never ha- was focused on completing the trail. I was just loving the outdoors and nature and just loving the fresh air and the breeze and just feeling it. And just, I had a dog and my, my job was to take care of my, my dog and do the best I could and be partners with him. So we lived together in a tent for pretty much seven years and went to the, went into towns and got apartments during the winter times in different States. And we loved life. But, I'm, I'm not understanding this. So you, 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 you were literally were drifting up and down the East Coast for about seven years, but I know you were actually in a ten or eleven year relationship with your partner. Um, was was that during the time you were going up and down the the states, or was that after that period of time? I'm in a eleven year relationship now, and that was before. Right. That. Okay. Right. So I understand it now. So, so in that, in those seven years, were you, were you drifting for any reason other than you were quite comfortable by yourself or you just felt you couldn't fit in elsewhere? Well, it's a little bit more of a story because I uh, didn't successfully make it in college. I felt 
uh, one day late of my Native American scholarship, which would have brought me into getting my bachelor's degree. So after that, I decided, you know what, there's more to life than money because I was guaranteed a $50,000 a year job. So I said, you know what, there's more to life than money. And me, I just put on a backpack and just started walking and just trying to find myself for the way or just love life. So that, but that seven years out, literally living, kind of living in a, in a tent, that obviously got, sort of taught you some skills. Were you actually going anywhere or were you, were you how, how different was what you were doing then from what you actually did when you hiked the AT? Yes, it was much different because I wasn't really focused. Maybe I was focused to like get from New York to Virginia or get from New York to Tennessee or get from New York to North Carolina or get from down to Florida and then come back up. But they were just little trips. Right, right. How how unusual, Clark. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's strange. But then you met a woman um, and you've had this 10, 11-year relationship. How did she take to this kind of nomadic lifestyle of yours or was she quite comfortable immediately that you were going to settle down with her? Well, when we first met, I was still on the trail and right. she came to visit me down in Damascus. And right. from that point forward, I took her around and traveled a little bit up and down the coast and then we went to her house and that's when I met her grandkids and something bad happened. So I had to decide whether I was going to keep going on the trail or stick around and help her because she really needed someone to help her ad adopt these kids. And I saw that she was totally lost and right. scared. Well, well, ironically, I believe it was on your 10th anniversary as a couple <laughs> that you announced you were going to go on this uh, the Appalachian Trail hike. Firstly, how does she take it? And what was the the moment that you decided this was something you needed to do, having having walked up and down the East Coast for about six, six or seven years prior to meeting her? What happened that made you want to go on this, this hike this year? Well, the, the truth is that her son that was having these babies that we adopted was having more children. Oh. And he had three more kids and we were constantly watching the kids. And my life had changed from being an outdoor nature lover. And I came to be an inside babysitter. And every time I turned around, my girlfriend was always gone watching kids or the kids were always here. And I came to the point where I just had to get out again. I just needed to do it. And we were always taking little vacations and little, she was like, go on these little hikes. And it just came to the point where I just couldn't do this no more. I had to get out and completely do the whole AT so I could come back and successfully be with her and help raise these kids the right way because they, they definitely need somebody in their life like me. Well, you went out, obviously, and did this. Did she support you when you were out on trail? I mean, it, it's never easy to leave anybody uh, at home, but was she a supporter of yours when you were on the trail? Oh, she was so supportive. My goodness, you know, at first she was so scared. She didn't know if I was leaving her or not coming back. But she made sure that she kept me or, and she made sure – she knew my every move and where my next stop was and where she could send me food and supplies. And no matter what it was, she found out everything that I needed. And it didn't make matter what it was. It could have been a handkerchief, a toothpick. Um, <laughs> it was in my box the next time. Oh, that's cool. That's really cool. Because, you know, we, we've often talked on this show how important that, that support from home is. So I'm glad you had that. But I, and, and I know you've been walking a lot. We talked about the seven years before. But a five or six month hike, because you said yours were shorter, shorter um, journeys before. A five or six month hike is something quite different. How did you prepare? Let's start with the physicality. Were you fit already or did you need to train? I believed I was fit already. I I'm, I go to the gym all the time and I, right. I love to run and I love to walk. And I made sure I stayed in there and did my exercise. I, yeah, I was ready 100%. Right. And what about the gear? I mean, once again, it's a different thing to just for, to living out of your tent with your dog. Um, and by the way, you didn't go with the dog, did you, on this trip this year? No, this no. is one thing that helped me get through the whole thing successfully was not worrying about anybody yes. else but myself. <laughs> I'm sure. So what about the gear? Um, how did you firstly, how did you find out what you needed? I pretty much knew all the basics I needed. And it was kind of different going out this year because 
the water filters had changed the the books and the and I never heard of these apps before. And, and now I'm getting familiar with people on the trail telling me, oh, you've got to get far out and <laughs> you've got to use this kind of a water filter. And yeah. everything was just so much different. So did you learn on the way or did you work out what you needed before you left? Or were you actually making changes along the, along the route? I pretty much learned along the way. I got the app before I left and I had no idea what how, what I was doing with it. So. <laughs> People had to teach me and show me that stuff. But, you know, that's okay. You know, and the great thing about it, Clark, is people do learn this stuff on the trail. So that, that that's absolutely fine. Um, and But gear isn't cheap, is it? Were you able to accumulate enough stuff to give you a proper shot of finishing or were you not expecting to go all the way? Did you Or, or did, when you started, were you literally saying, I am going to keep going until I get to Katahdin? Oh, I was definitely going to keep going to get to the end. I was focused. I kept looking at myself like a champion, like a winner, like I'm going to make it. I'm here for these kids. These kids' voices are going to be heard all along the way. More people will ever know the story. And, and this those kind of things that kept me going. Yeah, you know, because as I said to you before, Clark, I didn't know this story at all. I, I'm sure lots of Americans do know the story, but lots of Americans probably don't know the story, and I, and I certainly didn't. How did your, you know, we talked about the gear, getting your gear and so on. How did your gear work out? Were you um, were you quite happy with your choices? I was very happy with almost all my choices except for shoes. This year, instead of sticking with my Merles that I always went with, or the low ones, uh, what are they called? <laughs> trail know. runners. Trail oh, runners. All right, yes. yeah, yeah. Go I'm ahead. always gone with them. Yeah. But this time I went with, uh, I don't want to say the name because I don't want to put them down, but it was a certain brand that just came out and they're absolutely <laughs> not hiking shoes. <laughs> That's not helpful then. So you had to change those out pretty quickly. And, and you started early March. Tell us what those early days were like. The first few days, every time I went down to Georgia, the around March 3rd, it was always beautiful. But once you start getting a few days into it, the weather starts to change and it gets drastically colder. Yeah. We were, we had a couple good storms up there, a couple good winter storms. Yeah, but you know from what you what you've done before that you know if you're going to be out there for six months, you're gonna you're gonna face weather, whatever that weather is. So it's kind of one of those things. There's nothing you can do about that. And um, were, were you hiking solo or did you form a tramley on the way? Because I, I'd imagine you've been a solo hiker pretty much most of your, most of your life, haven't you? Yes, I love hiking solo and I love being by myself. And um, there's certain things you can do do alone and just be quiet. And I love the quietness. And that's my thing is be able to hear nature and look and see and feel everything. And I do like hiking with other people. There was a lot of times I would come into shelters, mostly during the rain, and get to know people that way. Right. But will you tend to stop at shelters or would you stop short of a shelter so you didn't need to interact with other people too much? I would I would try to stop a little bit further than the shelter. I, I had a certain mission, like I'd go a little bit further than the shelter and then watch everybody take off. Yeah, and then I'd try to keep up. I like to be alone, so I was always behind everybody. I tried to stay behind but still keep up with the same group. Oh, nice, nice. And – and we all know that a through hike is a very expensive pastime. And you previously shared with me that you're on Social Security. How did you manage financially out there? Because, you know, I always say to people, when you go into towns, you hemorrhage money, don't you? Yes, we do. And I hung out with a couple of people up towards the end of the trail that were spending 100 bucks on every single meal. And, yeah. you know, I see the way people eat, and that wasn't the way I ate along, along the way. I, I pretty much stayed away from the towns if I could, and I go into very few only when I needed to resupply. And I try to stay away from all that expensive stuff and drinking and beer all the time. <laughs> it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's a very tempting thing to do, but, well, you know, it is a very expensive way to, to live out there, certainly. I know people have got by, somebody got by on five, I think it was $500 for the entire trip. Wow. He, did it in, he did it in four months. I don't know how he did it, but what, what that's, that's kind of a, an, another thing. I don't know how, how anybody does that. Um were there days out there that you wondered why you were doing it, or did you just get into the rhythm and you, the enjoyment of the hike fairly early, early on, or was it the cause that was driving you on? I really enjoyed the hike. 
and I started out alone, so I was able to build up a nice rhythm by myself and get going. It was it was about halfway up when I started getting cold and wet all the time and freezing when I wondered why I was doing this <laughs> because it just wouldn't end. But I just kept thinking about those kids. They need to get their voices out. They need to be heard. So that's what kept me going, even through the hard times, even when I it was getting really hard and I wanted to stop. And how different is what you did? You know, a, a through hike of the Appalachian Trail it is its own entity, a six-month thing from beginning to end, five months, whatever it is. Um, how different was it from what you used to do? You know, just as we, as we, I think you accepted the word drifting <laughs> over the years. Was it, a, was it a different vibe, or was it much the same sort of thing? It, it's a lot different. Everybody here was on a mission this year. There was nobody that really wanted to st- sit around and talk or enjoy things for <laughs> quite a long time. Yeah. So that was quite different for for me because even the ways about it, there are shuttles every place. I was always used to staying in the woods or sending somebody out to go get food and coming back. There's so many shuttles today and so many people helping you. It's a lot different. Yeah, and you know what? That's one of the things. Yeah, you probably didn't have anybody help you in the past, did you? Because you weren't actually hiking a trail. You were just kind of hanging out in the woods, which is an entirely different thing, I suspect. Um, so... You, I understand you also came down with Lyme disease on this trip. How did? How, firstly, how did you notice it, and did you get it treated in time? I didn't even know it was Lyme disease. I just thought I had a water deficiency. I just thought I was getting old because I kept getting t- <laughs> tired, and I'd watch everybody like get ahead of me and go really fast, and I just felt like, well, I'm always wet. I'm always cold. Maybe I'm just getting older. I'm getting tireder. And uh, I didn't realize it was Lyme disease until I got to the hospital. It was on top of um, that mountain in in Massachusetts. Uh, um, Greylock, Mount Greylock. Greylock, yes, that was it. I was up there, and I, that's when I started getting hot and cold chills, and I couldn't get out of bed. And, and I soaked the bed all night, and I'd get up, and I'd try to move tomorrow and the next day, and I couldn't do it. And I couldn't afford the room after after the second day, and... And I told them, I was like, can I work for stay? And they looked at me like I was a little nuts. They knew how sick I was. So it was 7 p.m. when somebody came up to me and said, hey, your room's paid for for the night. So I thought to myself, you know, you can't keep doing this and taking other people's money for a place to stay. You know, you're so sick. You can't get out of here. But you got to get you got to go. You got to get to the hospital one way or another. Yeah. So what'd you do? I made it to the bottom of Mount Greylock and there was a lady there I can't remember her name but she had a house on the corner with a place you could stay at in the yard and she let me stay there a couple days and I thought maybe I'll get better I'll drink a lot of water I'll try to eat some food and well she ended up taking me to hospital a couple days later and that's where they told me what I had I had Lyme disease didn't you get didn't you get the telltale sort of bullseye was it on your back or do you know where you were bitten I have no idea. Right, okay. So how did they treat it? With three different antibiotics. Okay. And did you have any long-term effects? I'm still taking antibiotics today. Oh, wow. Wow. I've been pretty slow along the whole way because of that. It's been a long time. (laughs) And, you know, that's bad enough. In fact, I would say getting Lyme disease, disease is almost as bad an injury as you can get actually on the trail in many ways. But one of the guys that you were hiking with had a really nasty health health issue near the Kennebec River, didn't he? Tell us what happened. Well, me and um, Side Miles were hiking for quite a bit, for 100 or so miles, a couple hundred mm-hmm. miles and we were looking out for each other all through the whites. And it came to the point where we were coming to the Kennebec and we we're three miles away from it. And it was getting close to two o'clock and the, and the boat was going to stop going. And he said, Coyote, he goes, you go ahead, go grab the boat. He goes, I know you're faster than me. I says, I will. I'll go catch him and I'll tell him to wait up for us. All right. I got there 10 after one and, and uh, I waited till two. He never showed up. All right. The guy in the boat said, well, your friend didn't make it. He'll have to wait till tomorrow. And that, that's when we got a phone call. He got a phone call saying there was a 911 emergency and somebody needs to be rescued. Wow. And 
his observation of the rescue was not exactly what happened, but he was telling me that the guy was into the water up to his chest having a heart attack and he needs to be rescued. Oh. Now, I asked him, what can I do? And he took off in a car and just left me. So I said, you know what, Clark? Well, you know what, Coyote? You have to, you have to keep going no matter what because you've got a deadline to make. He's getting help. He's getting rescued. He's in good hands from here on in. So as much as it broke me, I had to go. How, would, how was he? Did he recover and get back on trail or was he off I, to knock him off trail? I was able to contact his wife and they told me that he had a helicopter come and get him. He had to get to another helicopter, be brought to Bangor. He had <sighs> a stent put in his heart and he got off trail. Nice. Okay. But well, at least he was he, okay. He was very happy after I talked to him the next day after that. And he was glad he got off trail because if he ever went into that 100-mile wilderness and had a heart attack, I sure. don't think it would have been the same. That would have been tough, yeah, no doubt about it. And you finished on Katahdin on September the 30th. And that was a particularly significant day for your cause, wasn't it? So tell us about what September the 30th is. September 30th is Every Child Matters Day. And that's when everybody wears the orange in support of the the child whose orange shirt was taken away from her when she was brought to the school. Her grandmother had given her a shirt and she never had much in her life. And she really loved that orange shirt so much. And when they took it from her and the stories got out how much she just loved that and she was just so hurt. We do this in honor of all the kids that were taken, but we're doing it in honor of her wearing orange. And what was her name? I'll cut that out. Don't worry about it. So you climbed Katahdin on September 30th. How did the climb go? The climb up well, went really well. Well, you obviously got there. <laughs> yes. What was it like? You know, there's so many days I stopped for the rain and stuff, but Mount Katahdin, I had great weather all through the whole 100 mile wilderness which was the best time of my trip the 100 mile wilderness was the best weather yeah. and then climbing up katahdin was it was heart wrenching it was just so beautiful climbing because and it was so so sad because i knew it was my last hike my last mountain so i was trying to go slow but yet get up there with everybody else and just enjoy it all and that moment you touched the sign you know, I've done it twice, so I'm lucky enough to have experienced it twice, and it was equally magical both times. Were you when you touched it? Were you, were you thinking, "Thank God it's over," or "Oh my God, it's over," or um, "It's just over"? Did, were, were you kind? Were you feeling quite um, emotional at the time? Very emotional because I didn't know if I really wanted to come back. I didn't know if I wanted to quit. I just knew that. This was the way my body was, my body was thriving every day right. to move forward, to go like it was, I don't know, like it was a race, like my body's in danger or something. Now I have to stop. And that was a so, big thing. So now you have stopped. I mean, <laughs> so you, I see you're actually in a house with walls now. So you're back yes. home, I presume. I presume. What does it, what's it feel like having stopped? Do you feel Do you feel the need to go again, or, or how are you feeling? How are you feeling about it? I would love to go again, but Mother Nature and the the mountains. I don't think I'll ever travel on such a hard hard trail again. If I pick another trail, it's going to be a little bit easier at this age. <laughs> how old are you, by the way? I haven't actually asked you. I'm 61, and I have. Hey, you're a kid. I did that first. I have, I, I'm t I'm 10 years older than you. Uh, <laughs> you're a kid. You got to have plenty of years yet. I've got one lung and a half. Oh crikey, that's also good. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, look. When we spoke before, Clark, you told me this litany of stories about your past that were, frankly, quite shocking to an old fat white guy like me. I, I couldn't relate to what you were saying really in many ways. And I'm sure you understand that. You probably get that a lot in, in your life. I didn't intend to cover those stories in any detail here, but it seemed to me from what you told me that you never really felt grounded in your life. Did the trail provide you with something to take forward? It does. And it did. It did because I realized 
I don't know how to say it, that I think I was looking for something and trying to be selfish with my life. And I always wanted this for me and I always wanted to go off and do things for me. And once this was completed, I felt like, you know what? I've been missing out. Nobody really knows who I really am because I'm not given to other people like I should be. I've spent all this time to myself and I just, I don't know, I just felt really selfish that I did this for myself and being gone so long. And it just gave me the need to be connected with people more around me. Well, in, well I, if I can give you some solace on that particular front, somebody said described this the other day. Because I, I said this is quite a selfish endeavour to go away for six months, and I, having done it twice, I feel very much it was selfish of me to do it, do it twice. However, this guy said to me, "It's more self care than selfish, and if you have this feel to be out there, you're looking after yourself. That's not a bad thing, you know. So." Try to turn that round in your mind and make it self-care, but then going forward, the thing you've learned, you want to connect with people, then it's done you some good in that self-care. It's done you some good to allow you to connect with people. Does that seem a reasonable argument? Absolutely. I Let's like go that. for that then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's Absolutely. go for that then. And as far as your cause is concerned, was it was it worth it in the end? And do you believe you've at least educated some of the people you ran into out there? I do. As long as I've opened up a few people's hearts and mind and, and get them to help and respect the cause when they see the orange flags being flown and the people in the orange shirts, it makes the whole world a difference to me. Even if it was just one or two, it, I'm just so happy that so many people got to experience it. Well, look, I, I didn't know how to end this, and, and I'm just going to end it with this incredibly strange hobby that you have, which which apparently is a chainsaw wood carving, which is um, about as weird as it gets, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I was wondering, why didn't you do a carving of Katahdin? I'd pay for that. <laughs> or if you've done a carving of Katahdin, oh, you've done – did you do that – now, this is, this is not very good for a podcast, by the way. He's actually – he's actually you didn't do that with a uh, – that's the, he's turned his camera around to show me the brown sign of Katahdin. Now, you either stole it from the top of Katahdin, <laughs> which I think is unlikely, or you, you, you've you bought it, you've carved it. You, you can actually carve the mountain. Wouldn't that be cool? Yes. You should do it. <laughs> yes, I definitely have plans. There you go. Okay. Well, look, you know, you've got a very unusual story, and and I'm I'm glad I took the we we battled through the technical reasons that we couldn't do this to make it make it happen. And I so appreciate you coming on uh, on the show and sharing your story. And I'm and I'm going to make sure we put enough links in the show notes that show what you're talking about, and that will be you know be helpful. So, thanks for coming on, and I just wish you well in the future. Okay. Ah, oh, thank you, and thank you for having me, Steve. Okay, really man. Take it that. easy. Take you it too. easy, okay? Cheers. Bye. See you. Cheers. You've probably heard me say that I'd cut something out towards the end, but I chose to leave it in. I know we don't video the podcast, or sometimes I think we should, because Clark was really feeling that moment, and I didn't want it to end up on the digital cutting floor, so to speak, so I left it in. That lived experience, something many of us have never had to experience, was visceral, and Clark was fairly intense throughout our conversation. He wanted his story out there, and I've added some links in the show notes to give you more of an idea about Every Child Matters. It was certainly all new to me, and I'm glad we were able to bring it to you. Now, just before we speak with Jessica, I wanted to revise what I told you last week about the show. As many of you know, I've been reading a chapter, or part of a chapter, from a hiking book every week on this podcast since the beginning back in 2016. Apart, of course, from the times I was hiking and podcasting from the trail. And with Then the Howl Came coming to a finish, I was intending to read Emily Lenner's Happy Hiker about her through hike. While I was looking through it, I noticed that there will be insufficient time for me to finish the book before I headed to the UK for my hike on the southwest coast path in April. So I've decided to give myself a bit of a break and start Emily's book after I return from the UK. Until then, I'll have the usual main interview, followed most of the time, by a second section. These could include other hikes, though I'll also be bringing back some of our Mighty Blue Class of 23 to share their after-hike thoughts with us. So, if you have done a hike on any trail that you think might be of interest, then email me at steve at hikingradionetwork.com and we'll sort out a time to record. 
Well, whatever happens, my first episode back here after the UK will include the first chapter of Emily's book. So, with very few miles to go, let's hear from Jessica. Hello, Steve. Hey, Jessica, how are you? I'm good, how are you? You're just a few days from the end. <laughs> I so, am. And my first question to you has got to be, because uh, we've had pretty lousy um, storms down in Florida, and I know it's coming up the East Coast, so how's it been for you? Uh, yeah, it's been interesting. Uh, mm. Mostly yesterday, uh, we were slack packing, and it wasn't too bad in the morning. It was just very foggy and kind of drizzly, and then later in the day the wind started to pick up and the rain started to pick up but luckily thanks to your listener bill we were inside before the worst of it really hit um, oh that's so cool that's so yeah cool. it definitely it dumped rain overnight the place we got off yesterday when we got back there this morning like there was just a trickle of a stream there last night and this morning it was like a raging river and thank goodness <laughs> there was a bridge over it so, oh dear yeah uh, yeah the weather is definitely trying to test us one more time <laughs> so i know last time we spoke you were going to be staying with your your husband's cousin did that take did that happen yes yes it did we ended up staying there for two nights they slack packed us for a couple of days and uh, you've been slack packing since about since about massachusetts haven't you <laughs> it's at been amazing least connecticut at least connecticut <laughs> yeah <It's, laughs> really uh, you should write a book about how to do this little thing as a, as a slack packer. That's a, for, firstly, <laughs> appear on the Marty Blue Show and be last exactly. to finish. Everybody will want to help you get there. It's <laughs> <laughs> a very good strategy, yes. I wish I there thought of it sooner. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one of my favorite little towns was a place called Boiling Springs, and, of course, you've now been through that. You said it's, very, it's a pretty town anyway, but you said it was beautifully decorated for Christmas. Yeah, we walked through, we were slack packing that day and we had a fairly long day, so we didn't spend much time hanging out, but it, they have just redone that little pond or stream or whatever it is that's like right in the middle of town yeah. and the gazebo was all decorated and it looked like they had um, like plastic jars out for luminaries that they were probably going to be putting out soon and it was just all super pretty. And that was the end because you're going southbound once again. I'm already turned around all the, all the way. That's the that's the that's the walk from Duncannon. We did that in one day from Duncannon to Boiling Springs, which is 26 miles, the longest day I've ever done hiking, by the way. But Ooh. it was uh, yeah, because it's a it's a really flat, easy walk, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. We I took a couple of days because we had this black packing going on, but uh, yeah, you finally get to the point at least going southbound where you're thinking like, oh, this is the wide open fields and flat part of Pennsylvania that everybody's promised us. That's oh, right. Yeah. You, know? you knew they'd be there somewhere, didn't you? <laughs> Sooner or later, it had to show up and there it was, yeah. And very disappointingly, even though you're not uh, at the half, you're not, you're not at the halfway point, you're about the 97th percentile point, um, <laughs> you you. Didn't get to do the half gallon challenge because the store was closed. <laughs> Disappointing. Yeah. Were you going to do it? I was totally going to do it. I feel like I've been training for that my whole life. I <laughs> wanted to do it. But yeah, we got there, at, like that whole park, you know, and gates were closed and everything was closed. The store was closed. And oh, I think we God. probably missed them by, I don't know, a week or two. It sounded like they hadn't been closed terribly long. Oh, but yeah, geez. totally missed out on that one. But I've had no snakes in Pennsylvania, so I'll take it. <laughs> I didn't have any, and I'm shocked really? that I didn't. Yeah, I didn't have any snakes in Pennsylvania first time. I did second time, but first time I had, did not have a single snake, and it shocked me. But uh, you wow. know, because everybody tells me there's tons of them as well, because they're, they're they're always nice of it to be avoided. But when you were in Pine Grove Furnace State Park, that's where the Appalachian Trail Museum is. Was that open? Were you able to see that? No, that wasn't open either, and I was very disappointed about that too. Cool, you really are. You're on the, you're on the Appalachian Trail for owners at the moment, aren't you? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> oh dear. And um, and you said you 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 Bill picked you up and you, yep. you slept for a couple of days and you stayed in Gettysburg. How far is that from the trail? Uh, depending on where you're getting on and off, about a half an hour or so. 
Nice, nice. So that that must have worked out really well. So once again, yeah. thanks, Bill, for for helping out. It's really nice. Oh my gosh, Bill! Bill was so good to us. Like when he picked us up, he had drinks waiting for us and snacks. <laughs> and yesterday, when we got off trail and it was starting to get so nasty, he handed both of us a service of hot chocolate. Like we can't thank him enough. He was so oh, so kind to us. You know what, though, Jessica. You know, because people, you know, they they want wanted you to succeed, and they're they're really he he knows what hikers want. He's listened to the show. He knows they like food and drink, and it's yeah. it's an we're an easy hit, aren't we? Really, we'll you know we'll take anything, won't we? Well, so, he's a, quite the hiker himself. He told us all about his adventures up in the Adirondacks, and I told him you should have him on the show to talk about the Northville Placid Trail because he talked to us a lot about that and both of us are now like ooh another one to add to the list you know? I, I certainly will funny enough Bill get in contact with me because I, I, I'm i looking for to fill in this middle section once Jessica's finished I want to put other trails up there I've already got two or three recordings of different trails so please get in contact Bill and, and, and we'll talk um, Quarry Gap Shelter which is always one of the best shelters there it was actually decorated for Christmas which is pretty over the top, even for Quarry Gap. Tell us about that. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, we're walking down the trail, and the next thing I know, you know, this, we knew a shelter was coming up, and uh, you're walking down the trail. The next thing I know, I'm like, is that a Christmas wreath on the side of this <laughs> shelter? And I figured, like, oh, okay, that's cool. Somebody, like, threw a wreath. No, this whole thing was just totally decorated for Christmas. They had live wreaths all over the place. There was garland. There were ornaments hung up. There was a little uh, pine tree that was near the shelter. They had that all decorated with ornaments. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, like, how many people are actually going to see this at this time of year? And yeah. look at this effort that they went through to, to spruce the place up. for. I mean, it was just, it was kind of amazing. We were totally shocked by just the, like you said, just the shelter itself. It's like incredible. I've lived. I've actually lived in more spaces than that shelter. <laughs> it's, it's awesome, yep. especially on a lovely sunny day. It's a really, really beautiful place. And you now feel you actually feel like you're back in the back in the south. Has the weather been kind to you, or, or is it because you know you've been expecting it to be really cold? But how have you been coping with the weather? Uh, the, I mean, the weather. I thought a couple of weeks ago. It's been kind of funny because. The time we've been in Pennsylvania, like I went to Alaska for two and a half weeks last summer, and the weather was better in Alaska than it's been here in Pennsylvania <laughs> right now. Um, but, you know, <laughs> that was July and August in Alaska, and this is December in Pennsylvania. But, yeah, um, go figure. Yeah, I mean, it, it's been, we had a couple of really nice days, like actually when we went through the Boiling Springs area and yeah. just before that, like we had a couple of, days where at least like it was sunny but like the wind has been really gusty and that kind of stuff and now you know we're running into we're in an airbnb right now because with the dumping of rain last night and now the wind is absolutely howling outside and whatnot um you know it's it's been cold but like the trail itself like all of a sudden we're seeing more rhododendrons Nice. And, you know, just like the vegetation is changing. In fact, I passed, I all of a sudden I stopped dead in my tracks this morning because we hiked past a holly bush. Like, I didn't even know that was a thing until I got <laughs> on the trail down south. And like, <laughs> here we are again. And that was just before we crossed the Mason Dixon line. So, yeah, it's, that's a it's special starting moment. to just look more like the south, too. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, and you're, I mean, how many miles are you away now? I think we're about 40 miles away. Yeah. So you could finish early. I know you're waiting for family and friends to to, to catch up. So you, you're actually slowing down. Are you going to take a couple of zeros or what, what's the plan? Uh, we're still trying to decide what we want to do because, you know, the temperatures are supposed to drop pretty dramatically over today into tomorrow. The wind is supposed to be pretty bad tomorrow again. Um, we have... In a way, we have so few miles to go that if we don't have a, you know, I don't want to hike three miles and then be shivering in a shelter for sure, hours. Sure, uh, sure. So we're trying to kind of decide, do we want to take a zero? Do we want to divide it up? Different, like we're still kind of sitting there 
trying to figure out what the smartest thing is to do, but my husband has plane tickets, so the 23rd is the day. Yeah. Oh, right, right. And, and what, what time do you think you're, you, you're going to camp just outside or something <laughs> and then just walk in in the morning? I mean, that's kind of part of what we're trying to decide is do we stay the last night on the trail? Do we try to get off and get cleaned up so our family and friends uh, don't have to smell us? Or, no, <laughs> you know, no. Just walk no, in you the sh- last three miles. Like, I, I think it's the Ed Garvey shelter is the one. Bef- I think it's the Ed Garvey shelter yeah, is the one yeah, just is. before Harper's. It'd be kind of nice to be in a in a shelter on the trail for the last night, don't you think? Maybe you yeah, don't think. But- I don't know. <laughs> I think a lot of it depends on the weather. <laughs> yeah, you know what? And absolutely right. And as you're you're talking now from an Airbnb, then that's that was a new feature, which of course it wasn't available in 2014. Well, not that I knew anyway. But it certainly was in 2019, and and I I used it. I think it's a great option for people. You know, you can get a four bedroom place, you can get about ten people in there, can't you? So you know, it's right. one of those yeah. th- one of those things you sh- you should try and do. So right at the end now, you now know you're going to do it. Got you know. Assuming you're not you're not going to fall, Are you starting to feel relief now at last because I know you've been worried about falling for about the last seven hundred seven or eight hundred miles. Uh, when I saw the Mason Dixon line sign today, I just I started crying. I'm like, I can't believe it. We're actually going to do this. Like, <laughs> I think um, I've just been reserving judgment to see what happens, and that was kind of like holy cow, like, we are actually going to do this. That's right. Um, that's right. Damn yeah. me. Right. So I, I don't think I'm relieved yet. I think when I hit that CNO canal pass, like, then it'll be like, okay, if I trip up the stairs, I should still be able to make it across the river, you know? <laughs> uh, well, the 23rd, I think, is Saturday, isn't it? It is. 23rd yeah. Saturday, which is yeah, it's kind of nice to finish on Saturday anyway. So and are many people coming in? I'm not entirely sure yet. Uh, for me, it's my husband and my dad. Um, right, Mike's right. got different friends and family members that are going to try to make it. So that's lovely. Are you we'll thinking of, you thinking of trying to finish sort of early afternoon that sort of thing? Because you want to have a proper day's hike, bit bit of hiking, don't you? Yeah, I mean, again, it depends on kind of what we decide to do sure. for that last night, but uh, at least there'll be a few miles there at the end okay. for sure. So, and it depends on. When everybody's getting there, you know we're gonna we're gonna wait to make sure everybody wants to be there yes. to be there. So. Yeah, because you don't you don't walk in there. There's no one there, do you? <laughs> right after all this. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. Well, look, I'm so excited for you. I can't tell you. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's been a long time coming, but it's coming. It's there, and you're still gonna be, still there. You'll be our fourth successful through hike this year, which is amazing. So it's a, we, our numbers were much better than we thought they were going to be. But look, uh, I'm hopeful I'm going to be able to record you on Saturday if possible. Um, and so you know, we'll we'll try to coordinate that at some stage soon. Um, but look. Enjoy those last 40 odd miles. Stay out of the lousy weather. If you're an Airbnb, bloody stay there for a couple of days. Happy days and then yeah. just walk for the last three days. I don't know, whatever it is, obviously, you'll, you'll do what's right for you. But try to avoid the really crappy weather now because you don't want, you know, you don't want to slip over on a really, really wet r- rock or a root, do you? I mean, it's just going to piss no, you off. Right. So. I said the other, a little while ago, like, neither one of us needs pneumonia for Christmas either. So, like, <laughs> Yeah, right. we want to stay healthy for sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. We're pleased to really pleased to catch up again, and um, we will speak for the last. Well, not the last time, but you know, for the last time in this series, as it were, <laughs> we'll speak hopefully this Saturday. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay. Cheers then. Bye. 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 She could almost certainly do it before this Saturday, but with flights booked, people coming in, then Saturday is going to be. I'm changing my normal Saturday routine to be standing by to record her when she gets there, and we'll all hear about it next Thursday in the last show of the year. Last week, I made a call for a few more donations. I'm delighted to say that several of you responded positively, and we had a bit of a bumper week. So thanks to all our donors this week, including monthly donors Suzanne Johnson, Michael Garsh, Betty McEnany, Sean Deadwiley, Sharon James, Anne Pickin, Kevin Weidman, and Emmanuel Bravo-Ramas with Scott Cavellia, William Salentano, Stephen Martin, Curtis Fackler, G. Bolt on the Trail, Carol Dodson and Clifford Bates, all supporting the show with a contribution, and some of them wishing me a Merry Christmas. Thanks to you all, and back at you with a Merry Christmas. Now, 
Also for the second to last time, we hear how George Stephanos completed his Appalachian Trail dream as he shares his own ascent of Katahdin. I hope that you all have a wonderful Christmas or whatever you celebrate at this time of the year. I'll see you next week. Chapter 26. Mountain. Katahdin Stream Campground, Maine, to Baxter Peak, Katahdin. Monday the 3rd of October 1983. Mile 2138.5. Journey's End. I awoke a couple of times last night to the sound of rain. Though it was just a light drizzle, it indicated that the weather report which I had heard was correct. I would not have my moment in the sun on Katahdin. Needless to say, my dreams were extremely depressing. In the one I can still remember, I was bitten by a rattlesnake and was dying when I awoke. I had eight Pop-Tarts for breakfast this morning, sort of a final Pop-Tart orgy. I doubt I will crave anything that sweet back in my ordinary life. I also had two cups of hot chocolate. Altogether, I ingested enough sugar to send an entire kindergarten class into orbit. Late morning burnout would not be a problem today. I waited around for a while, still hoping my mother would show up with some film. She didn't, and I could not resist the magnetic pull for long. I started up the road to the ranger's house with what turned out to be one remaining frame of unexposed film. I asked a guy I passed if he had any film that he would consider selling. He had just put his last roll on his camera. I even asked the ranger. He didn't own a 35mm camera. I dropped off my unnecessary gear on his front porch, a through hiker tradition, signed the hiker register and started up the Appalachian Trail. It was 8.30am, October 3rd, 1983. There were 5.2 miles to go. Just as I was reaching the outskirts of the campground, I passed one final camper. I tried one last time. He told me that he only had rolls of Kodachrome 64 and Ectochrome 64 remaining. I'd been shooting Kodachrome 64 exclusively all trip. I'd despaired of finding anyone with film, and this guy had my exact brand. I've had my share of lousy luck on this hike, but I've also had instances of incredibly good luck at times, and I made it to my mountain, so what else matters? The roll that he sold me was only 20 exposures, but it gave me 22 shots compared to the one I had. You can always weasel an extra shot out of a 35mm roll of film if necessary. From then on, my spirits were high. I was initially somewhat disappointed in not receiving a nice day to climb Katahdin, but Mother Nature had saved up one last curve to throw at me, and this one was a pleasant one for a change. Contrary to the forecast, the sky cleared gradually as the day wore on. It remained hot, humid and hazy, but even the haze dissipated considerably by afternoon. The sole lingering tinge of disappointment was the memory of the low, solid cloud mass which had obliterated the sky yesterday evening. I didn't see the fading alpine glow on Katahdin on the eve of my climb. Conditions were unchanged this morning. I know it seems trivial, but somehow I never really doubted I would get to live the vision I'd followed for 2,000 miles, even after hearing the forecast. It had grown so real and I'd worked so very hard to get here. The beginning was remarkably easy. The path was wide, relatively rock-free, and climbed in a very gentle grade. It followed a bank of Katahdin stream up to the base of a set of cascades where it crossed over to the other bank. At this point, the trail became a bit steeper. Short side trails brought me to several overlooks of Katahdin Falls. Then the Appalachian Trail left the stream and began ascending Hunts Burr. I'd come 1.2 miles. There were four to go. The trail climbed steeply for a short while, then levelled off. It crossed several open areas with great views of the surrounding mountains, particularly of a long range which stretched out to the west. A rather routine hike took a somewhat bizarre turn as I neared the small stream crossing which would put me 3.1 miles from Journey's End. A chorus of shouts and whistles erupted from the treetops just ahead. A young couple who had stayed in the lean-to adjacent to mine last night were perched high up in two tall trees, hanging on for their lives. Don't go up the trail, the lady warned me. There's a very surly bull moose out there. Apparently, they had interrupted a couple of moose sharing an intimate moment, and the bull had charged them. Hey, I'd be just a little ticked off myself, were I in his hooves. Actually, it was no laughing matter. After five months of giddy recklessness, the time had finally arrived for me to embrace sanity. In the autumn mating season, males become rather crazed. Of course, we human men have thoroughly evolved from that nonsense. And moose are plenty big enough to back up their anger. I paused to contemplate a sensible alternative. It would be stupid to take any crazy risks when I was so close to my goal. Images of some adversities I endured to get this far flashed through my mind. 
I got pissed off. To hell with it, I heard a voice which sounded suspiciously like my own say. I'm not turning back now because of one horny f***ing loose. Perhaps you would have to backpack 2,135.4 miles to understand how I felt. I strode forward, mean and macho, and, well, kind of stupid, into a large clearing. The moose, number eight on this trip, was standing at the far edge of the meadow, glaring and snorting at me, but I flashed him an even darker scowl and snarled a few choice phrases. I think I caught him by surprise. He gave me a startled look, which seemed to say, But I'm a big bad moose! and stopped dead in his tracks. He continued to favour me with some nasty muttering, but stayed put. Sticks and stones. I called back to the tree people they had let me pass, and I kept going. As I ascended, the grade began to stiffen, and the rocks over which the trail climbed grew into boulders. I was sailing along, still soaring on a massive pop-tart sugar high, encountering a few real problem areas. The trail was steep, but walkable. I passed several slab caves along the way. The breakout above treeline was breathtakingly sudden. One moment I was moving along, scaling huge boulders beneath a solid canopy of trees. The next, I was climbing a short, exceptionally steep pitch and popping out into the open sky. I was 2.4 miles from Baxter Peak. The ensuing mile covered most of the elevation gain of the entire hike. I had to human fly straight up enormous boulders. It wasn't pretty. At one point, I found myself an unwitting contestant on the new Baxter State Park game show, Hike or Die. Earlier in the climb, I'd passed several iron rungs driven into rock faces to help the hiker over the more dangerous stretches. Here, I reached a point where I had to drag myself up a vertical face to a tiny ledge overhanging a huge drop. The MC of the show turned to me and asked, George, do you think the state of Maine would blaze the trail over this rock to that ledge without adding handholds if there weren't any natural handholds on the rocks above? I thought about it for a second and replied confidently, of course they wouldn't. Dragging myself up to the ledge, I perched precariously on my knees and felt for those handholds. A buzzer sounded. With smarmy, phony sympathy, the MC intoned, Oh, I'm sorry, George, but that was an incorrect answer. Now, try not to plunge to your death. Hanging there on my knees, my centre of gravity was too far back and I was being pulled away from the rock towards a long, quick descent. Finding nothing resembling a handhold, I pressed every available square inch of my body up against that cliff and gave it a warm embrace. Well, to tell the truth, I was damn near making love to it. I've somehow found enough leverage to pull my feet up and get off my knees. Then I was all right. I shuffled sideways to a more secure perch. Except for that one incident, which was only bad for a few moments, the climb up Huntsburg was fun. It was maniacally steep, it had many tricky parts, and it was strenuous as hell, but I rather enjoyed it. Apparently, a superabundance of adventures has finally finished twisting my mind. There were awesome views along the entire climb. I took my time, rising slowly and steadily. I never actually sat down for a rest. I didn't need one. I did pause a few times to take photos and enjoy the views, but mostly I climbed. I finally reached the gateway and broke out onto the tableland. I pulled myself up to the top of a final large boulder and a span of flat trail unfurled before me. I had survived the last great test and Baxter Peak was in sight. There were 1.6 miles to go. I quickly passed Thoreau Spring, the final landmark on the Appalachian Trail. Exactly one mile remained. I felt nothing. I was nearing the top of a mountain which I had essentially been climbing for more than 2,000 miles, but the end was coming on too quickly to sink in. My feelings were a mass of contradictions. I was glad it was over. I was sad it was over. I was missing my family and friends and looking forward to seeing them. I was already missing the Appalachian Trail and my life upon it. The hardships and occasional disasters were all behind me, yet I knew I would miss even those in the manner that a Sherlock Holmes would be diminished by the loss of his ablest foe, Professor Moriarty. Somehow, this incredible mishmash of contradictory feelings all added up to nothing. Perhaps, in a sense, I'd always known this would happen. It would explain why my driving vision had always been me on the eve of my climb rather than on Baxter Peak at the end of my quest. I climbed the last stony piece of trail up Baxter Peak, a large pile of boulders atop a high, windswept plateau of naked rock. I followed the white blazes to the sign which marked the summit of Katahdin and the northern terminus of the Appalachian Trail. Then, in a habit which had become deeply ingrained after 2,138.5 miles, my eyes automatically searched for the next white blaze. It wasn't there. 